In 2 Timothy chapter 3, last Sunday we looked at the first four verses and the, the Apostle Paul sounded an alarm with these verses about perilous times. He's been describing the character types and the attitudes of those who make the times perilous. And more troubling than that is the fact that they're found in the church as well as in the world. Um, The pastors that I know of and keep in contact with and the churches that we know of I'm aware of situations in those churches more now than I ever have been. It seems virtually every church is faced with difficulties, strife, contention. There are heresies, people falling for them. There are people that are leaving and people that are gone. I'm aware of these things more now than ever. Things that two or three years ago I never would have thought possible. And um, how do we account for that? I think these verses at least shed some light on that. And these perilous times are in part because of those who have a purely external religion and a counterfeit faith. I'm talking about the visible society of professing believers. We have dozens of churches in our own town. We have churches that are wealthy all the way down to home churches that are small and in all of this in all of society and churches worldwide. Not just in our own land, in all of society I'm speaking of, the visible church, there are people within them whose character and whose conduct are disturbing because they fit these verses. It would be easy for us to sit here today and say, you know, those guys I work with and the world all around me, the people I pass in the streets, the people I have to deal with. I understand why the world is the way it is today. The politicians, the leaders on the world scene, the generals in armies and so on, the things I see in the news, I understand why the world is the way that it is today because these things apply to them outside the doors. But it's not just them. It's in the visible church as well. Until the end of time, there will remain weeds among the wheat. And what Paul said to Timothy, as I've been, I hope I've been communicating, proceeding through these pastorals, what Paul said to Timothy doesn't just apply to Timothy in his circumstance and in his day. Otherwise, we might as well take a penknife and cut these verses out right here. Set them aside and say, well, that was insightful for Timothy in his day. The application is, is to us as well. So for today's sermon, I'm going to address it <clears throat> under these headings. One, appearance. Two, absence. And three, avoidance. They all start with the letter A. I'm sure that immediately is obvious to you. So first, appearance. We read in verse 5. Verse 4 finishes with lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 
We said that's the essence of idolatry. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. The first heading, appearance. I'll speak to you on that line. The appearance is outward. It's called a form of godliness. Now, godliness has its form. Godliness has a way of expressing itself. The means of grace in the life of a believer. Godliness has a form. And we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because some have a form of godliness but deny its power any more than We quit eating because we get a bad meal at a certain restaurant. Godliness has a form, and all form is not bad. But here is a form that is outward. It has an appearance of godliness. Um, There's plenty of superstition in the realm of Christendom, you know. And it's not always holy water and crosses around the neck and things like that. Paul went to preach in Athens and there was a group of people there that he noticed were very religious in all respects. And so he preached a sermon on the unknown God to them. Preached about a living God. Here they were religious in everything. The city was full of idols. A form of godliness. And various ways superstition uh, presents itself. Of course, we could see, I think of the way there in 1 Samuel 4, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It was viewed in a superstitious way whenever the Israelites got defeated by the Philistines. They said this, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And you remember them? They were priests. The Bible says they were worthless men. They were committing immorality with the ladies who were serving in the temple. So here's nothing but pure superstition. We lost the battle, let's go fetch the ark and bring it here. The ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp and all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth shook. And what happened? Israel ended up being defeated. There was a great slaughter and Hophni and Phinehas were killed in the battle. It was nothing but superstition. We see it all the time, how widespread it is. Politicians, celebrities, sports heroes. The guy gets up from sliding into third base after knocking in two runs, and the first thing he does before he takes his batting gloves off is he pulls the cross out from his shirt, kisses it, and points up. Superstition. That's all it is. Long John Silver, the pirate captain in Treasure Island, received the dreaded black spot from his rebellious pirate mates on a folded piece of paper. He opened it up and realized that it was, it was black spot on a torn page of the Bible. And he says this, look here now, this ain't lucky. You've gone and cut this out of a Bible. What fools cut a Bible? You'll all swing now, I reckon. And here he is, a murderous thief, but yet he's pronouncing this condemnation on his shipmates because they cut a page out of a Bible. I'm probably the only preacher you'll hear quote Long John Silver (laughs) from the pulpit. 
course, it's fictitious, but it serves a point to illustrate. Superstition is everywhere. And it's based on appearances. Appearances are everything in this case. People are satisfied with appearance. It's fashionable religion. It's popular religion. And it's like a change of clothes. It's easy to put on and easy to take off. Formal Christianity. The men described here in these early verses, they profess religion. Somehow they're in connection with the church. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't be warning Timothy about them. So that tells me that everywhere there's a great deal of external worship where there is no godly devotion that proves to be nothing more than superstition in the end. Paul told the Corinthian church he was speaking about those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. And they were in the Corinthian church. External religion is self-satisfying. It fills a need among those who practice it. And in their mind, it assures them of some kind of standing with God. It appeases the conscience. It's external in its form, but there's no reform. And it pleases the ego. You remember the Pharisee? The Pharisees, they were the they were the top of the line as far as religious leaders were concerned. And the Pharisee stood in the church and he actually prayed this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And then he points out what he does religiously. I fast twice a week. And I give tithes out of all that I get. He was very religious and he was proud of it. His ego. Religious pride is the worst kind. So they profess religion and somehow they're in connection with the church, holding a form of godliness. I read a sermon by J.C. Ryle and it's called Formalism. And it's on this very verse. He says this, I'll quote him to you. He says, When a man is a Christian in name only, and not in reality, in outward things only, and not in his inward feelings, in profession only, and not in practice, when his Christianity, in short, is a mere matter of form or fashion or custom without any influence on his heart or life. In such a case as this, the man has what I call a formal religion. He possesses indeed the form or shell or surface of religion, but he does not possess its substance or its power. That's the first heading, appearances. They're all about appearances. This terrible list that we looked at last week ends with holding a form of godliness. Appearance. Then I said I would preach to you on a second heading, absence. What they don't have, absent, is power. they have denied its power. So they formerly, they for, formally have an outward show, but they have no life or power or no principle of operation in them. It's in the head and it's not in the heart, in other words. There's some dimension missing here. Um, last week, Bella and I just put flowers out at the mailbox here. I don't know if you noticed when you came in. They're really pretty. But you know, one of the good things about that is I don't have to worry about killing them. 
I don't have to water them or anything because they're not alive, even though they look good. You see the illustration, don't you? They have a form of godliness, but they've denied its power. It's not alive. There were a lot of statues pulled down in the last year or so in public places. And you know those people that pulled them down might be charged with vandalism or destruction of private property, public property, whatever. But they'll not be charged with murder because there's no life there. No matter how realistic those statues are, they look, they have the form, the shape, they look good. Thomas Hall said, a painting of food never kept a man from starving. Isaac said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. There's something wrong there. This is formal religion. And it may as soon carry you to heaven as a dead horse can carry a man on a journey, so says Spurgeon. Like dry bones in the valley, they need to be quickened to live. Now, the Apostle Paul dealt with that in several different places in the Scriptures. To the Colossians, he warned them of those who were in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, celebrating the shadow, but not the substance. They were delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels and submitting themselves to decrees, rules, like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. So here's religion described right there. Some form of godliness. Do this, don't do that, and... It's okay. These are matters, says the Apostle, to be sure they have the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion. But in the end, he concludes they're no value against fleshly indulgence. There's no power there. It's much easier to observe the outward forms of religion than it is to submit your heart and life to it. That's why it's so popular. I was in a softball league once, a church softball league once. <clears throat> and uh, the Catholics really liked the schedule that we were on because it allowed them to go to church on Saturday night and sleep in on Sunday morning. It's popular. It's easy. This kind of religion. It requires no difficulty, no exertion, no sacrifice, no self-denial. It's opposite to striving to enter the narrow gate. It's opposite of wrestling with principalities and powers. And the Bible speaks about running a race that's set before us and fighting a fight, the good fight of faith. It's opposite to all that. Formalism dispenses with all of that for a few religious rules and habits to keep. Jesus said, This people honors Me with their lips, but their heart is far from Me. And he goes on to say, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the rules of men. So these right here are having a form of godliness, denying its power. They're not allowing it to exert any influence on their lives. Now, that's everywhere, I say, in the world. In churches everywhere. James spoke about a man's religion that's worthless. He said, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. He can't control what he has to say. 
He contrasts that with pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father. And what is it? It's practical love and diligent devotion. He says, tend to the orphans and widows. That's practical. Keep yourself unstained from the world. That's devotion. But this kind here, this formal religion, it imposes no restraint, produces no godliness. It's not the rule of the life. When we, when we um, observed Titus in the first chapter, we got to the end and it said they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him. That's the same kind of thing, a formal religion. Now, the Bible teaches everywhere that the heart is the seat of all true religion. It's got to be that way. It is that way. Everything else is mere intellectualism. Facts can be known. The life remain unchanged. That's, that happens everywhere. I've seen it. I've seen people that have been able to talk wonderfully about good books that they're reading, and they're reading all the right books, the good books. And their doctrine, you know, it fits right in with, with us. Had people approach wanting to attend the church that said the right things, and their doctrinal views were, were biblical as far as I could tell, but the thing that I discerned was the heart was unchanged. True Christianity always begins with a changed heart. Always. For with the heart one believes and is justified. Then everything else falls in line. The form of religion comes from the heart. It's internal and not external. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Paul thanked God for the Romans. He says, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And in the first letter to Timothy, Paul said the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. It's a new covenant blessing that God will put my laws upon their heart. That's the change right there that has to happen. Otherwise, it's formal religion. Now, I was spoken to by this sermon this week. There were some real wrestlings in my own heart because the question is, for you and for me, is this talking about me? Is my religion formal? Is it superficial? Or is it from the heart? Am I changed in my heart? And if so, then the prayer ought to be, may it never be me. J.C. Ryle went on to say in his sermon there, I'll give you another quote. He says, we ought to dread and avoid formalism. Sin comes against us with a drawn sword and strikes at us like an enemy. While formalism will take your hand with a smile and look like a brother. But both have one end in view. Both want to ruin our souls. And of the two, formalism is the one most likely to do it. Just fit in and have a form of religion. Whether it has any power to restrain you or change your life or anything, just... So they have an appearance, 
but they have an absence of power. Then I said avoidance. He says, avoid such men as these. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. It's hard to tell it at first. In the end, it proves out. Eventually, eventually the sheep's clothing comes off and lo and behold, here's a wolf. And then you're in trouble because a lot of damage comes to pass. Jesus went on in the next verse to liken them to thorn bushes and thistles on which you don't find figs or fruit. Paul, when he cataloged his dangers in 2 Corinthians 11, he said, dangers from false brethren. That was among the list. And to the Thessalonian church, he said these words, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. Apostolic tradition. To the Roman church, he said, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. So here again, this teaching, this apostolic doctrine, contrary, what is the result? Dissensions and hindrances. Keep your eye on them, turn away from them. In that portion, he says they're smooth, they're flattering, they're deceptive, and it's the unsuspecting that pay the price. So avoidance, they're dangerous. They need to be avoided. Let's read on, verse 6. For among them are those who enter into households, and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here they are, these men in Timothy's day, and I have to think in ours as well, as much as these verses apply, they're men that are getting into the family unit. They're insinuating and inserting themselves into private household settings. They're taking advantage of the weak and the vulnerable. That's what they are here. Weak women weighed down with sins. Women are the weaker sex. The Bible speaks of that. The devil targeted Eve and not Adam in the very beginning. It seems by the flow of this text right here that these are easy targets. These women have issues. They're weighed down with guilt. Things like that. These women right here in this text are too accepting and not suspicious enough. So they're, they're, because they're unwary, gullible we might say, or naive, too naive to suspect anything harmful, then they're taken advantage of by these false teachers and probably it's referring to them being led away to their way of thinking. They're entering into households. There's there's something intimate, insidious. There's something underhanded that's happening there. See, that's why these times are so perilous. And this kind of a sermon is not the kind of sermon that a pastor really likes to preach. All of these, last week, all of these bad things that are happening, and then today you have to highlight the fact that he's saying sometimes these things are in the church and you've got to watch out for that. He strikes a comparison here 
He says, just as, in verse 8, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. Well, if you read the Exodus account in chapter 7 is where it begins. It's the occasion where Moses is in the court of Pharaoh. And the word is, let my people go. And God told Moses, if you go into Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go, and he doesn't do it, work these miracles. And he gave him some miracles to do. You recall that? Cast your staff down on the ground and it'll become a snake. Well, if you read the account in Exodus 7, Moses did just that. But then there were these guys who were called magicians. Let me find it. I just want to read just a couple of verses to you out of it. In Exodus chapter 7 and verse 11, Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. That tells me that they made a staff turn into a snake somehow. And we're to understand that. Now, some of the commentators will go into all kinds of gymnastics to try and downplay the fact that a stick in the hands of a magician could actually become a snake. But when you read the account, the the snake, Aaron's snake, swallowed theirs. That tells me it was legit. Whatever they did, they duplicated Moses. And the end result was, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them. In verse 22 of that same chapter, the fish in the river Nile died because it turned to blood. That was one of the other miracles Moses was to do. Take some Nile river water, pour it out, and let it become, it would become blood. We're told, but the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord said. The magicians duplicated it. The very next chapter, there are frogs that were produced everywhere. Frogs everywhere. If you can imagine that. The magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Out of the River Nile, they did the same thing. Duplicated it. But it was a counterfeit. And again, what was the end result? Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Now he... He asked for Moses to get rid of those frogs. Apparently, the magicians could make them, but they couldn't get rid of them. Once they did, I guess. So Moses got rid of the frogs. The magicians said in verse 18, they they tried with their secret arts. Um, This is gnats. They tried with their secret arts, but they could not bring forth gnats like Moses did. They said, this is the finger of God. So now they're getting to the spot where they can't do it. They could bring frogs out, but they couldn't get rid of frogs. A little bit of inability there. Now they can't bring forth gnats like Moses did. He was able to bring forth the gnats. And then the very last occasion were the boils on man and beast and the magicians, they could not even stand before Moses then because they had boils on them like everybody else did. So that's the background, Janus and Jambres. You don't get their names here in the text, but apparently that's the ones that are being referred to here in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Janus and Jambres who opposed Moses. So they were known for their counterfeit miracles. 
So these men, the ones described in the earlier verses of chapter 3, oppose the truth, just like Janus and Jambres. Here's the comparison. They're men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. So here are these two real-life individuals named from the Exodus account in Moses. You don't find in the text that they tried to make light of the miracles of Moses or call them into question about whether or not they were authentic or anything of the sort. All they simply did was tried by imitation to depreciate the value of the genuine. And that's what it did. Here Pharaoh is. The, the staff is cast down onto the ground. It becomes a snake in front of him. Aaron's staff. Man, that's authentic. That's surely got to be God. Oh, wait a minute, says the magicians. We'll do the same thing. They do the counterfeit right there. becomes a snake. You see, the counterfeit depreciates the original the real thing. Their attempts to duplicate the miracles, they were trying to reduce that which was extraordinary about them. But in the end, they were gradually forced to concede they couldn't even stand before Moses any longer. In the end, it's the true and the genuine. It's always opposed by the counterfeit, but the true and the genuine will rule out in the end. Verse 9, they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. He says their thinking is warped, their mind is depraved. That's the words used there. They're rejected in regard to the faith. These men, they've, that is, they've been tested in regard to the faith, the Christian teaching and the gospel, and like counterfeit coins, they're, they've been found wanting, and so they're discarded as worthless. Rejected in regard to the faith. Now, we've got in Matthew 7 that very troubling portion where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's the outward form of religion. Lord, Lord. How is it different? That's the counterfeit. How is it different from the original? The original, the legitimate, is he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven will enter. And then he points out, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles? That's religion. That seems on the surface to look at it. That's, that's wild, outlandish religion. Casting out demons and doing miracles. But in the end, they did not make it. It was some sort of formality, some sort of form of religion that was void of power. Power to change the heart and life. Spurgeon says, in reality, this kind of religion is in opposition to Christ. It is Janus and Jambres all over again. The magician of hypocrisy is trying to work miracles which belong to God only. Nobody can do so much damage to the church of God as the man who is within its walls but not within its life. Well, Paul says they, they're, they won't make further progress. Their progress will be hindered. And surely that means a few weak people will be taken in by it, made to see their way or whatever. Unsuspecting ones. But in the end, the firm foundation of God stands. We saw that in the previous verse. The Lord, or the previous chapter, the Lord knows 
those who are His, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Their folly will be exposed. Now, this kind of religion, and this is, this is where it started to maybe get close to me and maybe to yourself as well. This kind of religion, or the one who possesses it, he has no power to bear trouble with joyfulness. His whole life is one of externals, when he's driven by force of negative circumstances to seek his joy in the life within, he fails. Now just as Janus and Jambres failed to do all that Moses did, so there are some things that the mere formalist can never accomplish. A sham Christianity withers up in the days of trouble. It fails like the magicians when needed the most. The form may do for bright and sunny days, when, but when, when uh, bright and sunny days when sorrow and sickness are unknown, but it requires the power to triumph in the winter night and to take joyfully the spoiling of the goods. I don't know who I just quoted there, but it's pretty powerful. So I had to look at my own self, and I was convicted by that. Man, when the circumstances turn sorrowful and grievous, if we can't find joy from within, where can we find it? If a man's religion fails him when times get hard, it's not a true religion. So what do we do? How, how, how do we read this and, and say this is not me or I don't ever want it to be me? What do I do? This is what I say. I say act and use your graces. I mean the means of grace. You hear me use that term pretty frequently. Be in the Bible without fail. Pray without fail. Make the meetings of the church. The public meetings of the church. Those are the means of grace. They're taught everywhere. They're taught in the history of the church. They're taught in the Bible. Prioritize those things. That's the way to increase and to quicken them. Turn good intentions into resolutions and actions. Good intentions don't do anything. We've got to blow the spark into a flame. And then we've got to feed, feed the flame. These are perilous times, perilous days. That's what he's saying right here. <clears throat> Resolve and make certain that you're a Christian at heart. That your heart has changed and what's in your life is power to change. There's a life there. Be sound, solid, convincing Christians in practical holiness. Otherwise, whatever we're practicing has no power against fleshly indulgence. That's what Paul said to the Colossians. Don't be content with a mere formal religion. It won't get you to heaven. Then someone said, delight in quickening company. I like that phrase right there. Delight in quickening company. Be with the people of God. Interact with humble, holy, active men and avoid the company of dead, formal, earthly-minded men. That's pretty practical. Interact with the church. Delight in quickening company. Don't be distant. There's, there is a quickening action in the company of God's people. 
Um, there's a really good illustration. One burning coal set, sets another burning coal on fire. They keep warm together. But you take one coal out of the fire and set it off by itself on the hearth, soon goes out. There's nothing there. We can't afford in this day and age to be distant. Make the meetings. Make the prayer meetings. Make the, re- make the Sunday morning meetings. Prioritize that. Be in one another's lives. It's, it's so important. That's why we're admonished not to forsake the assembly together. These are perilous times and we cannot doubt God's judgments are about. In all of the land, His judgments are about. May it never be us. Well, that's all that I have.